Hello and welcome back to Restoration Literature. Today we'll be looking at John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester, whose life model seems to have been live fast and die young. His father, Henry Wilmot, was a cavalier general in Charles I's army during the Civil War. The loss of the Battle of Worcester meant the loss of the war, and Henry was tasked with the job of taking the young Charles safely to Europe. Their successful escape and his work as Charles's advisor while abroad endeared the man to the young Charles, and in the end he made him Earl of Rochester in 1652. In the meantime, his son, who had been born in 1647, was being brought up and educated by his Puritan mother. Henry died in 1558, leaving the title of Earl of Rochester to his son, John. As Henry had been a personal advisor to Charles II while abroad in Europe, Charles was really looking forward to helping his advisor's son do well in life. Rochester was now in his mid-teens, and Charles thought it would be a good thing to send the young man off to a tour of Europe. Charles provided the funding and also provided a tutor, and this tour allowed Rochester to learn and study many things that he otherwise never would have gotten to study. He later returned to England after getting the best education that any man could wish for during the Restoration era. It is also at this time that Rochester really begins to cause some serious trouble. Samuel Pepys was a government administrator who kept a very detailed diary for about nine years during the Restoration period. For a decade, he recorded gossip and political scandal, and in one entry, he talks about Rochester's most recent scandal. Thence to my lady sandwiches, where to my shame I had not been a great while before. Here upon my telling her a story of my lord Rochester's running away on Friday night last with Mrs. Mellet, the great beauty and fortune of the North, who had supped at Whitehall with Mrs. Stewart, and was going home to her lodgings with her grandfather, my lord Halley, by coach, and was at Charing Cross seized on by both horse and footman, and forcibly taken from him, and put into a coach with six horses and two women provided to receive her, and carried away. Upon immediate pursuit, my lord of Rochester, for whom the king had spoke to the lady often, but with no success, was taken at Uxbridge. But the lady is not yet heard of, and the king mighty angry, and the lord sent to the tower. As a result of this, the eighteen-year-old Rochester spent almost a month in prison, far less than he deserved, before being released by Charles II. It appears that the beautiful, young, and very rich Elizabeth Mallet had rejected a marriage proposal from Rochester. And Rochester decided that Elizabeth had no right to say no, and thought that by kidnapping her, he would win her over. Mallet had very good reasons for rejecting him. Firstly, he was too poor for a woman of her status. Secondly, she was 14 years old. And thirdly, Rochester had a bit of a reputation of being a womanizer, and in modern day terms, a man whore. Rochester had slept with pretty much anyone and everyone since his early teens, and that is a behavior that Mallet felt would not be appropriate in a husband. It appears that either she developed Stockholm Syndrome, or that Rochester's continued wooing finally won her over, because she consented to marriage two years later. This was a mistake on her part, as her husband could not keep it in his pants, and continued to have so many affairs that even modern-day doctors would have trouble curing all the STIs he had contracted. This unfortunately meant that she too got syphilis, the disease that we suspect Rochester died from, and died less than a year after her 33-year-old husband. After the kidnapping scandal, Rochester set out to redeem himself by serving in the Dutch War. Gilbert Burnett, who converted Rochester upon his deathbed, and who later became the Bishop of Salisbury, says this about this period in Rochester's life. By falling into company that loved these excesses, he was, though not without difficulty, and by many steps, brought back to it again, and the natural heat of his fancy, being inflamed by wine, made him so extravagantly pleasant, that many, to be more diverted by that humour, studied to engage him in deeper and deeper intemperance, which in length did so subdue him, that, as he told me, for five years together, he was continually drunk. Apart from abusing commas and semicolons, Burnett was mostly interested in showing the world that even a man like Rochester had a soul to be saved. And so most of this piece, which was written posthumously, is dedicated to minimalizing 
Rochester's scandals and maximizing his good points. This has led scholars to believe that this piece was entirely about self-promotion and they don't put much faith in Rochester's real conversion. Rochester's wit and humor made him a great favorite at court, but he also had a need to cause trouble, and his 1673 poem, A Satire on Charles II, caused such a scandal and angered the king so much that he was banished from court. Listen to a few lines and you'll understand why. In the Isle of Britain, long since famous grown, for breeding the best cunts in Christendom, there reigns, and oh, long may he reign and thrive, the easiest king and best-bred man alive. Him no ambition moves to get renown, for the French fool that wanders up and down, starving his people, hazarding his crown. Peace is his aim, his gentleness is such, and love he loves, for he loves fucking much. Nor are his high desires above his strength, his scepter and his prick are of a length, and she may sway the one who plays with the other, and him make little wiser than his brother. Poor prince, thy prick, like thy buffoons at court, will govern thee because it makes thee sport. Tis sure the sauciest prick that ever did swive. Twould break through all that makes its way to cunt. Restless he rolls about from whore to whore, a merry monarch, scandalous and poor. To Carwell, the most dear of all his dears, the best relief of his declining years, oft he bewails his fortune and her fate, to love so well and be beloved so late. For though in her he settles well his tars, yet his dull graceless bollocks hang an arse. And you'd believe, but I'd had but time to tell ye, the pains it cost to poor laborious Nelly, while she employs hands, fingers, mouth, and thighs, ere she can raise the members she enjoys. All monarchs I hate, and the thrones they sit on, from the Hector of France to the Cully of Britain. The French fool, of course, is a reference to the King of France, while Carway and Nelly are both two of the king's favorite mistresses. The comment about his scepter and his prick being of a length is not a compliment, but rather it's an insult, because the king is shown to care equally about ruling his kingdom and his own personal sex life not a quality you want in a monarch. Another poem that Rochester wrote about the king that did not get him into trouble is this short piece. We have a pretty witty king whose word no one relies on. He never said a foolish thing and never did a wise one. To which Charles laughingly replied, that's true, for my words are my own, but the actions are those of my ministers. Voltaire and Afrobin were both great admirers of his work and even Thomas Shadwell used him as a model for some of his characters in his plays. As England entered the Georgian and later Victorian period, Rochester's work was forgotten, mostly because it was considered too obscene to be read. And with poems titled Signor Dildo, it is no surprise that the Victorians disapproved. Rochester inspires a sense of fascination in his readers, as it is impressive that he dared to publish such satirical works about the king, who could have had him beheaded. His early death at the young age of 33 is a warning to anyone who wants to live a similar lifestyle, but it is also a testament to the amount of work he was able to produce, even though he was completely smashed most of the time. His behavior is not excusable, but it is entertaining, and you'd be hard-pressed not to enjoy the satire and parody that is found in so many of his works. I'll leave you with Rochester's poem, The Disabled Debauchee, which is a piece that juxtaposes a retired and battle-scarred admiral with a playboy who has become impotent due to a sexually transmitted illness. Like the admiral encourages young men to go to war, Rochester is encouraging young men to take up the seduction of women because he no longer can do it himself. As some brave admiral in a former war, deprived of force but pressed with courage still, two rival fleets appearing from afar, crawls to the top of an adjacent hill. From whence with thoughts full of concern he views the wise and daring conduct of the fight, whilst each bold action to his mind renews his present glory and his past delight. From his fierce eyes flashes the fire he throws, as from black clouds when lightning breaks away, transported thinks himself amidst the foes, and absent yet enjoys the bloody day. So when my days of impotence approach, and I'm by pox and wine's unlucky chance, forced from the pleasing billows of debauch, on the dull shore of lazy temperance, my pains at least some respite shall afford, while I behold the battles you maintain, when fleets of glasses sail about the board, from whose broadside volleys of wit shall rain. 
nor let the sight of honorable scars, which my too forward valor did procure, frighten new listed soldiers from the wars, past joys have more than paid what I endure. Should any youth worth being drunk prove nice, and from his fair inviter meanly shrink, twill please the ghost of my departed vice, if at my counsel he repent and drink, or should some cold complexion sod forbid, with his dull morals our bold knight alarms, I'll fire his blood by telling what I did, when I was strong and able to bear arms. I'll tell of whores attacked, their lords at home, bods, quarters beaten up, and fortress won, windows demolished, watches overcome, and handsome ills by my contrivance done. Nor shall our love fits, colorous, be forgot, when each well-looked link boy strove to enjoy, and the best kiss was the deciding lot, whether the boy fucked you or I the boy. With tales like these I will such thoughts inspire, as to import mischief shall incline. I'll make him long some ancient church to fire, and fear no lewdness he's called to by wine. Thus statement like I'll saucily impose, and safe from action valiantly advise, sheltered in impotence urge you to blows, and being good for nothing else be wise.